Welcome. You will not be seeing my beautiful face today. So sorry. Uh, because you don't really need to see my face today. Ha ha. Uh, today we're going to talk about the evidence uh, for and the process of evolution. And uh, we're going to do it with Dapper Dinosaur. He's here too. That's me. I he's, exist. He's doing theropod things over there. Wherever yes. he is. Like having a horizontal spine that results in far fewer back problems than you silly balloon-headed apes. Must be nice. Must, it is uh, nice. Must be nice. Uh, and, of course, it's all being produced by wonderful Peter. Gonna go for it, Peter, our lord and savior. Uh, and so, um, I guess a bit of background. The idea for this uh, stream sort of came from Sal, uh, interestingly, if you guys know who sal is so thank him for that uh, because i uh well we watched part of a stream of his the other day where he was going through um his ideas on some different things and i i kind of wanted to do this to do this for a while because my channel is all about the, how evolution works and how this affects different groups of organisms and all that sort of stuff and i wanted to just do it do one single video where we sort of cover the whole process all at once and so you can show this to your friends if they don't understand how evolution works so uh, i didn't really want to do a big uh, normal video so we're just doing a live stream where we sort of do it casual like does that sound good well i wasn't told it was going to be casual so i still wore my top hat and tie but yeah it's fine all right you're you're always overdressed you see in the that's picture true. i'm just wearing i'm wearing a t-shirt and a cat so you know that's pretty i mean the cat's pretty fancy yeah yes all right all right. Well, I don't even have that on, so. <laughs> He's naked. Oh, we're demonetized. And just like that. No. Yep, didn't take long. <laughs> All righty. Let's, let's get to the PowerPoint. Please. All right. So let's, let's just jump right in, folks. Why evolution is absolutely true and really cool. Uh, in case you're wondering, in case you live under a rock or in rural Mississippi or something, I don't know. Um, evolution is not only a really good theory of biodiversity, it is the only working theory of biodiversity currently. Uh, if you have one that incorporates all the current evidence as well as more, uh, happy to see it. But there isn't one right now, so... So there you have it. It's also really cool. And we'll get into that. All right. Next slide. So these are just uh, this is just an outline of the contents. And so next. All right. Definitions. So uh, lots of people have lots of different ideas about what evolution means. I'm sure we've all heard. Um, it includes like the Big Bang and uh, the planetary formation and stuff like that. Right? right, right, exactly. Yeah, it includes, you know, stellar nucleosynthesis and all that sort of fun stuff. Except it doesn't. That's not at all what, what? biological evolution is about. So <laughs> so uh, if anyone tries to tell you that, you know, biological evolution includes like the origin of the universe, stellar nucleosynthesis, uh, planetary formation, even the origin of life itself is not technically evolution, interestingly. It's not biological evolution, let me uh, clarify. So biological evolution, uh, as is the consensus definition and has been the consensus definition since the 1930s, uh, when it was first um, sort of laid out by Ronald Fisher, Sewell Wright, J.B.S. Haldane, and the other population geneticists, is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. So this is a population level phenomenon. It's not an individual phenomenon in which one individual metamorphoses into a new species or a, a cute Pokemon or something like that. That's not at all how evolution works. Individuals have variations and these variations can spread through the population through different 
uh, means, different mechanisms, which we'll discuss. And in case you uh, have never heard that term before, allele, it is a version of a gene. Um, basically, you have mutations in genes, and these produce different alleles. Uh, an easy way to conceptualize this, even though it's drastically oversimplified, though it is pedagogically useful, pedagogically, I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that. I think anyway. it's pedagogically, but uh, who knows? Pedagogically useful? That sounds right. I'm going to go with that. Um, is Think about eye colors. So uh, if if there's, you could say there's a single gene, quote, quote, for eye color, but there are different versions of this eye color gene. There's blue, there's brown, there's green. And so these are the different alleles mm -hmm. for the same gene. Makes sense? Yes, I think another good example would be that, uh, as far as I know, there is, in fact, a single allele that tends to, that causes uh, sickle cell anemia. And people who are heterozygous mm -hmm. have only a slightly modified red blood cells, whereas those who are homozygous, meaning they have two copies of the allele instead of just one and one with a normal allele, are severely anemic. And so that's a, a well-known trait that varies on the basis of, I believe, just one allele. Yeah, and, you know, and the, and the reason I picked this is, like I said, it's just it's easy to understand, but it's very rare that there is some single locus uh, which maps one to one with a particular trait. And so that's why we went with this one. Uh, oh, so hey, one of the you ways you just told me that you're live, Jackson. Did you know about this? I do now. <laughs> oh, well, thanks for the late uh, notification there, YouTube. We weren't that late. But uh, oh. anyway. Um, so one of the mechanisms by which alleles can change in frequency, uh, within a population is called natural selection. And the technical definition is the differential reproductive success in a population. So alleles have, uh, affect organisms in different ways. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. Um, but these alleles can be, can, uh, allow you to survive and reproduce or not, or they can have no effect on you at all. And the environment will uh, will select four alleles that, on average, help individuals survive and reproduce rather than the opposite. Over time, uh, you have, or, and well, you can also uh, classify evolution into uh, different uh, different lengths, I guess, because these are basically just different ends of the same process. You have microevolution, which is genetic genetic change below the level of species. And then macroevolution is genetic change at and above the level of species, which includes speciation and adaptive radiations. And both of these terms were coined by a, a Russian entomologist named Yuri Filipchenko back in 1927. So they have not changed. I've, I've heard people say that these definitions have changed recently. They haven't in like 90 years. Or, yeah, or, or, about a hundred years. <laughs> so, um, I actually so, I like yeah. to compare it to um, erosion. So you know, a little creek cutting a ravine through the woods nearby, that's like micro er uh, erosion. Whereas mm -hmm. the Colorado River carving out the Grand Canyon is macro erosion. These are the same process, mm -hmm. but on vastly different scales. So you know, on right. the micro evolution scale, just like the little channel in, from the creek. You can get things like, you know, hey, this species has developed a thicker beak or longer legs. Okay. But on the macro scale, you get to things like whales and pine trees being common, having a common ancestor. Wait, are you telling me a pine tree gave birth to a whale? I am not saying that, no. Oh, well, okay then. All or right. the reverse. That a whale gave birth to a pine tree. I'm also not saying that. <laughs> um, I was being purposefully obtuse. All I right. Um, and then there's another word that's kind of that's thrown in here. Uh, so both of these terms, micro and macro evolution, deal with genetic change revolving around the concept of a species. But what's a species? Well, uh, puts on um, heresy hat. There are no species. <laughs> um, uh -oh. 
<laughs> takes off heresy at. Well, it's too early for that. Uh, the general biological species concept, also known as the, the Mayer biological species concept, uh, which because it was coined by Ernst Mayer in 1942, is a species is a population that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. And for pretty much your run of the mill uh, eukaryotes, that's pretty much all you need. Uh, does it work perfectly? Absolutely not. But does it cover a lot of organisms? Yeah, it works relatively well enough. And if you're teaching, you know, like a high school class on evolution, then that's for the most part all you need. Um, there are, of course, lots of other species concepts, and we'll talk about some of them a little bit later. <laughs> and then the speciation is simply the formation of a new species. And we'll talk about mechanisms and how that happens a little bit later. So, uh, next slide, please. Okay, so this is just sort of a broad outline of the basic process. Uh, we have in the picture on the left, you have mutations. So that's DNA. The mutations occur when the sequence of nucleotides uh, changes. And this is what uh, causes new alleles. You have new alleles as a result of these mutations. And these mutations can be selected for or against by the environment. And as you can see in that picture on the top, some of those alleles uh, or those variations are not beneficial and the uh, possessors die out, whereas others are beneficial and their possessors keep uh, reproducing and the generations continue onward. <laughs> and over time, as you can see on the, the bottom picture, this process goes on uh, for so long that uh, organism that populations will split and organisms will gradually change until they become fairly radically different from each other. And so in this picture, you have like a, a tree hopper on top and then a, um, a mantid on the bottom. And though this, again, this is an oversimplification, that's not how they're related to each other. It just shows you have from an initial population, you have a split where the recent, uh, the recent split, uh, they're still pretty similar to each other. But as you continue in either direction, they get ever more uh, different from each other. And that's precisely what we expect on an evolution. And a fun fact is that you can also see this with now very different morphologically uh, lineages that are relatively closely related. So, for instance, mm -hmm. the first fossil horses and the first fossil rhinoceros, basically identical. The first fossil uh, proboscideans, mm -hmm. those are elephant-like things, and the first uh, fossil serenians, which is like the dugong and the manatee also almost identical as you would expect from evolution as you go back in time members of various lineages look more and more like each other because they're getting closer and closer to their common ancestor exactly exactly right all right we're ready oh yeah next slide please Okay, and then this is just uh, summarizing it slightly differently. Every individual is born with genetic variations. Those are the mutations and recombination. We'll talk about that shortly, too. These genetic variations are inheritable. That means they can be passed from parent to offspring. These variations make one better or worse at surviving in an environment. That's the natural selection. And then the longer two populations fail to interbreed, the more different they will become. And that's speciation. Okay, next slide. All right, inheritance. So again, this is a very oversimplified picture, but what this is illustrating is uh, recombination. So though everyone has two parents, every allele in your body either came from your mother or your father, and we can trace the origin of alleles backwards through the generations to find their ancestry. We can do this both with family trees and also between species, depending on which genes we pick. And so in this instance, you have the child and recombination has occurred in everybody, basically. Um, and so this child has has uh, alleles from everybody, from all of his his um, ancestors. And of course, it's not quite how it happens, uh, but you can end up with um, lots of different or alleles from lots of different ancestors in you through recombination. Um, actually, I don't I don't remember if I put a slide in there about recombination, but um, 
basically you you get a um, a set of chromosomes from your mother and a set of chromosomes from your father. And during the process of, of meiosis, you can have what's called crossing over where the homologous chromosomes will exchange segments. And so you end up, or you may end up with a, a chromosome, which is say 75% from your mother and then 25% from your father, instead of being 100% from your mother. And that's one of the ways that variations are created. And since you, uh, you know, males make billions and billions of sperm cells throughout their lifetime. You, you know, you can come up with huge amounts of potential variation within individuals. Anything to add Dapper? Uh, no, I think you covered that quite adequately. Okay. Next slide, please. Okay. So there's a field of, of mathematics uh, in, within population genetics because population genetics is really just math. Um, called coalescent theory. And basically this uh, field uh, seeks to understand when the common ancestor of either a population or two populations or two alleles or two species, what have you, when they coalesce, that is when their common ancestor lived and there you have like molecular clocks and you can use fossils and all sorts of stuff to figure this out. Genes or uh, you know, genes and alleles coalesce at different rates. Uh, same with populations and species. And so this whole field is just figuring out how far do you have to go back to figure out when these populations or genes or whatever share a common ancestor. Okay, next, please. And so as an example, this is the uh, migration of humans across the planet. So if we take, for instance, uh, native, or, you know, uh, native indigenous uh, South Americans, they are descended from indigenous North Americans who are descended from uh, uh, East Asians who are ultimately descended from people coming from the Middle East. And ultimately, all humans trace their ancestry back to Africa. All of us. Uh, in fact, there's a paper that came out, I believe, just a week or so ago. Uh, maybe it was two weeks ago, which also was looking at lots and lots of genomes and shows quite conclusively, in addition to all the other data we already have, that humans absolutely originated in Africa. Our species originated there and then spread across the planet afterwards. And you see we left Africa in this picture between 100,000 and 90,000 years ago. So, yeah, so we definitely came from Africa. Not the Middle East? <laughs> we did not come from the Middle East. The, the okay. Middle East was a, a, you know, a location where humans have traveled, but right. not where we originated, nor Australia or... Polynesia or what have you. Okay. I just wanted to check because I've heard some people say that maybe it was the Middle East. Well, you know, um, some people have their their uh, ideas, but they're not correct. They're demonstrably incorrect ideas, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that, uh, that happens to be the case. So, next slide, okay. please. All right, so um, some people, uh, for some people, it's been a little while. Uh, maybe since you took a biology class or since you read anything having to do with evolution, and that's okay. So we're going to start. So again, we're, we're kind of covering all the basics right now, sort of the things you would have learned about in like a bio 101 class in college. Um, and so one of these things is called the central dogma of biology. Now, I know that's a really weird name. I didn't name it that. Watson and Crick did. But the central dogma uh, states that you have DNA, DNA is a, a sequence of nucleotides, a, a segment, um, is transcribed into RNA, and or, well, mRNA. And then that mRNA is translated by a ribosome into an amino acid sequence, which then folds, thanks to the uh, molecular uh, chemistry of the, the, the amino acids, into a particular protein with a particular function. Now, as it happens, interestingly, you can actually go backwards. Uh, if you use reverse transcriptase, you can uh, transcribe an RNA sequence back into a DNA sequence. And some of our genetic elements do that. They're called retro elements, and they're uh, derived, or you know, at least some of them are derived from viruses that infected our ancestors, which is also a really interesting subject that probably has some bearing on evolutionary theory uh, so 
Uh, if you change the DNA sequence, you, know, you have a mutation, well, then that will change the resultant mRNA sequence, or and that could potentially change the amino acid sequence that you get. Now, that doesn't necessarily happen. Uh, you can have what are called uh, synonymous mutations, which is where you have a mutation, but the resulting amino acid is the same. That happens yep. a lot because there are several different amino acids which are coded for by like five or six different codons, uh, which are triplet uh, or nucleotide triplets. I think leucine is one of them. There's like six different ways you can code for leucine. I believe most amino acids are coded for, if, if not all, by at least uh, two or three. And most right, of them by more. exactly. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. there's always a synonymous codon for um, any given amino acid. So there's always the option for a completely silent mutation that does absolutely nothing to the uh, mm -hmm. to the actual phenotype, which is what the organism is like as a result of its genome. That's, that's a phenotype. Right. Right, exactly. Uh, or the other type is called non-synonymous and not a synonym. You get a different amino acid. And this could, again, could potentially affect the protein. Now, just mm -hmm. because you affect the amino acid sequence, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to affect the protein downstream. And part of the reason for that is uh, proteins can be very large. They can have lots of components. And so if you change just one little amino acid somewhere... Well, yeah, maybe it doesn't affect anything at all. There's actually a, uh, a thing called alanine scanning, which is where researchers replace different amino acids in a protein with, uh, with alanine and see which ones are very important to the protein, which ones are not so important, which affect the function, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. so, so again, just because you have a mutation and just because it changes an amino acid doesn't necessarily mean it's going to affect the protein. Yeah. And interestingly, um, different organisms often have the same basic protein for the same basic function, but the amino acid sequence is actually different. So um, one mm -hmm. thing that going to say dinosaurs, um, now this is a little bit contentious, but you know, we're going to accept the, the results for now. Uh, when some of the tiny bits of recovered collagen were amino acid sequenced from a T-Rex, it turned out they were most similar to ostrich collagen. And that's because collagen while it's a single protein that, you know, basically all animals have, the amino acid sequence does vary from animal to animal, but in ways that's not going to cause significant damage. Because if you had, you know, really defective collagen, well, you would have a birth defect, which is also a thing that happens. But it usually doesn't get yeah. passed on in organisms under heavy natural selection, because it's usually significantly deleterious. Absolutely. All right. Ready? Oh, yeah. Next slide, please. All right. Mutations. Uh, so a mutation is a change in the sequence of nucleotides. You can also, so these are genetic changes. You can also have epigenetic changes, which we're not really going to talk about in this PowerPoint, but it just means you have changes to DNA which do not affect the sequence of nucleotides. And that, and that, is is yeah, kind of a field of what we need to discuss today. So, um, so mutations are the result of lots of different processes. Uh, I just chose point mutations for for this picture. Um, so you can have atomic scale changes like tautomerization, and basically um, molecules can switch back and forth between different uh, isomers of themselves. Isomers are it's it's all the same atoms within the molecule, but uh, a slightly diff or a different arrangement. And so, for instance, you can have a hydrogen uh, atom or a proton, if you want to call it that, uh, which switches from one location to another. And so it's still the same molecule. It's just a slightly different arrangement. And so by switching between these, these tautomers, which are um, equally, uh, or which, you know, can both occur in nature, um, if this happens before or during the process of DNA replication, then the, the enzyme DNA polymerase, which is involved in replicating the DNA could accidentally recognize that nucleotide as the wrong base pair. And if it does that, then it will add the, the wrong base pair to it. Instead of recognizing it, say as a G, 
it might accidentally recognize it as an A, right? And and then that's wrong, and so you get a mutation. That's that's a point. That's one way point mutations can happen. There are also other types. You can have insertions, uh, deletions, duplications, and these are also all fairly easy to understand. Insertion is nucleotides get added. Deletion is nucleotides get removed. And duplication is when you copy a segment. It doesn't have to be a whole gene. It can just be a, a little segment of the gene. And you they place them, usually they place them right next to each other. And so these are all different ways the mutations can happen. And these are the variations that individuals have. And then these individuals are acted upon by the different mechanisms we're going to talk about. And those mutations, if they're beneficial, can move, can, can increase in frequency in the population. Uh, would you like to add anything? No, I think you've covered it very well. Okay. I, I, Next slide, please. I have something to add. So oh, when go you, ahead, Peter. When you sent me... Uh, a new version of this with an added slide in in it would that be a powerpoint mutation absolutely never, never mind, never mind. <laughs> all right so here's an example um not everything as i know everything we talked about so far has been pretty theoretical so here's an actual example of this happening so uh a these are point mutations in a genus of garter snake called Thamnophis. Lots of these guys occur in, in North America. Uh, they may all be endemic to North America. I'm not entirely sure, but regardless. Um, so you can see uh, right under the letter A at the very top. So that is a protein. That is a, a diagrammatic version of, of a protein, which is embedded in, in the, the um, membrane. Uh, and I believe this... I believe this is in uh, the the neuro, the nerve cells, and so what this protein does, it's involved in pumping sodium across the membrane, and so what your nerve cells have to do is pump uh, sodium and potassium, which are on different sides of this membrane, across to the other side, and that generates an electrical potential, and that's how you send signals from your brain to the other parts of your body. That's why we say that neurons are basically electrical it's because they're interchanging these ions to uh produce differences in electrical potential which is what current flow is is when you have that e well that flow of charged particles right exactly uh so um so this protein and uh is involved in that process it's called NAV 1.4 and so you can see the sequence, the the genetic sequence uh, under C. So B is the phylogeny. It is the the relationship of the species to each other. And then under part C, you can see the the actual. Um, well, that's not the genetic code. That is the the amino acid sequence, the amino acids that are um, involved in making the protein. But point mutations have occurred where you see the little arrows are where point mutations have occurred. So in uh, Thamnophis uh, cauchii, or cuchii, however you pronounce it, um, there has been a single mutation, which has only affected one amino acid. Whereas in uh, the one right above it, <laughs> kind of hard to see, uh, in the one right above it, there have been three point mutations. Is that Atratus? It, it I think you're right. Um, and then uh, Thymnophis, then you got Sertalis down at the bottom. There are four. Uh, so get bigger labels, Jackson. I know. I, well, it's easier to see this when it's, when it's bigger. So my bad, my fault, people. Boo on Jackson. Um, so everyone so, should unsubscribe. No, don't do that. <laughs> oof. Don't uh, do that. <laughs> subscribe to Jackson Wheat. It's like the meme of, of putting the, the pole between the, the bicycle spokes. That's what we just did. Um, <laughs> so anyways, so the, the reason that these mutations are important is also in the Thamnophis environment occurs a newt called Terica, which produces a, a uh, tetrodotoxin, which is a type of neurotoxin. So what it does, it prevents the, uh, the enzymes from doing that, that swapping of ions and that causes paralysis. But each of these, these independent uh, mutation events 
has affected the enzyme in such a way that the, the tetrodotoxin can no longer bind to that, that protein, that enzyme. And now, uh, and now, uh, uh, they are, are resistant in a way that their ancestors were not. And this is simply because of a few point mutations. They didn't duplicate anything. They didn't move stuff around. They just changed a few letters in this gene, which resulted in a not, it's not even that the, the gene itself has a novel function. It didn't change its function. It's still doing the same thing. It's just now protected from this tetrodotoxin. So it is adaptively beneficial. Natural selection will select for it because these guys won't get killed should they accidentally eat, you know, a, a poisonous newt rather than, a, you know, a non-poisonous newt. Okay. Anything to add? Poor newts. Poor newts. Next slide, please. All right, duplications. So uh, there is a pervasive mis or there are lots of pervasive misconceptions yes. about evolution, but this is one of them. Um, so when organisms, a lot of times, and I'm just saying this broadly, but when a lot of times when organisms have quote new features, whether that be new metabolic processes or new morphological structures. Um, there's a tendency for lay people to believe that lots of genes were necessary to change uh, from one thing to another. And that just simply isn't the case for most things. Um, a lot of that, you don't have to come up with whole new genes to change a fin, a, a fish fin to a tetrapod limb. You just have to change how the pre-existing genes are regulated. Right now, does now, uh, does that not mean that you can have or you can't have new genes? Well, obviously not. Uh, you can have new genes. De novo genes are a thing. Those are regions of the genome that formerly coded for for nothing, but but came to code for something that happens. Um, you can find those in pretty much all lineages. But typically, uh, you don't need you don't have to rely on those to generate large scale changes in organisms. Generating large scale changes is more about modifying what you already have. And this is one example of that. So Richard Linsky and colleagues, they maintain these cultures of a bacterium called E. coli, Escherichia coli. And in 2012, one of those cultures, uh, which is called CIT plus, evolved the ability to metabolize citrate aerobically. So citrate is a compound which is in their, their uh, agar, agar. Uh, but, but, um, Diagnostically, E. coli cannot metabolize citrate aerobically. They can only metabolize citrate anaerobically. And so, with this, exp and so, uh, what happened um, with this um, experiment was they are, you know, letting these these uh, lines of bacteria grow, and they're taking samples every so often. And they found at one point that. The E. coli suddenly developed the ability to metabolize the citrate in their environment, which they normally can't do. And so they sequenced the genome of these guys, and they found out it's that the the reason was or is that um, that these these guys duplicated a segment of their genome and placed them end to end. And so one of the genes, and so you can. See here, the duplication contains CIT uh, T as well as the upstream regulatory region and promoter of RNK. So basically, RNK uh, or the back end of RNK got fused to the front end of CITG. And what happened? And so uh, RNK is activated under uh, aerobic conditions, while CITG is activated only under anaerobic conditions. And so as a result, uh, you get the aerobic activation of sort of the, the front half RNK, which caused CITG to also um, turn on. And then that activated CITT, which caused the, the metabolism of citrate. So nothing new was made. 
right? It, it didn't evolve a whole new set of genes or anything like that. It just duplicated a couple genes and, and a couple regulatory regions and put them head to head. That's what happened. Right. Would you like to add anything, Dapper? Uh, just that duplications can go all the way up to a whole genome. In fact, we know that Absolutely. Um, many lineages, including all of you, have had whole genome duplications in their history. So that's a yeah. pretty cool fact. Yeah, absolutely. Um, next slide, please. So I really like duplications because um, a lot of people don't know duplications happen very often. And like I said, people tend to think that evolving new structures requires whole new sets of genes when that just isn't the case. So in the picture on your left, so that is uh, relating to bat echolocation. So uh, uh, all the bats that are able to echolocate have a micro duplication of like this extra four um, uh, of amino acids, whereas the ones who do not don't have that. So they lost that micro duplication at some point and they're unable to do laryngeal echolocation. Whereas the picture on the right uh, those come from uh, uh, Dysostichus or Stichus is a um, uh, is a an ice fish, and it has repeatedly duplicated this um, this this section of a gene. So as you can see, it's not the whole gene; it's just the segment, it's just a, a few uh, or three nucleotides, and it has done this over and over and over and over and this caused a protein to be made uh, which prevents ice crystal formation in its blood because they live in Antarctica so it's a very interesting story I highly recommend you guys uh, look up that paper logs in Doolittle 1997 very interesting paper they go into all the nitty gritty of it all right anything else I don't think so all right, next slide. This is one Dapper should be familiar with. Uh, so again, um, you know, gene duplications. Um, in this case, for uh, uh, metalloproteases, as you can see in the in the seahorse, uh, which is what this chart was made for. It's a paper about the seahorse genome. Uh, they duplicated, or in the, the ancestor of all synathids, which are the seahorses and pipefish, there was a series of duplications of this metalloprotease, and seahorses use it in, or it is involved in, in male pregnancy. Interestingly, um, independently, platyfish also duplicated this gene over and over, and they are also, they do similar um, development for their offspring. So there's an interesting little bit of convergence. Yeah, the, the term that Jackson has on screen is ovoviviparous, which basically means that eggs are return, are retained inside the body until after they hatch, at which point the young are born live. But it's different from like mammal style placental development in that <clears throat> there is not a direct connection between the mother's body and the developing embryos. They remain enclosed in eggs. Yeah. All right. Next slide, please. Another one uh, Dapper may be familiar with. So this one's kind of hard to see, but uh, the point is that these are gene duplications involved in the uh, the formation of keratin, which is used in in claws and scales and feathers. So uh, feather the the feather keratins are just repeatedly mutated and duplicated uh, scale and claw. Um, keratin genes. Yeah. And uh, so, someone happens to know a little bit about an experiment involving that, don't they? Well, yeah. So there's a few things. Uh, one is these duplications and then subsequent occasional mutations on top of duplications have resulted in what's called theta keratin, which is a subset of the beta keratins that are unique to the reptile side of sort of the what's called amniotes, which is mammals plus reptiles and their various extinct relatives. And also, you can induce similar kinds of formations if you mimic the regulatory uh, sequences set up in birds to create feathers. If you then, if you mimic that chemically 
in alligator embryos, they will start to develop feather-like feather, uh, filaments instead of their normal skews. And also all this duplication is why we have things like the fine branching patterns in feathers, because it's setting up sort of like this recursion where it's like, okay, branch, and then branch on top of that. And then on top of that, you're gonna branch again. So it's a very neat system that creates extremely complicated structures, but it's still just that original beta keratin with duplications and then a few subsequent mutations. Yeah, absolutely. Next slide, please. Feather gators, little wild. I know it's not ethical, but there's a big part of me that kind of wants a feather gator to be uh, allowed to, <laughs> to come to term and actually hatch. So we get a fluffy alligator. I know, I know there's that huge ethical problems and we probably shouldn't do it. But the part of me who doesn't ethics. care about bioethics, which is a very small part of me, but it exists. <laughs> that part of me is like, no, let's do it. Floofy alligators. Who needs do it. ethics? Am I right, guys? We, we all do. But um, like, you know. Um, and this one, we don't really have to go into depth on this one. Just to hammer the point home again, this is uh, regarding elephant um, cancer. They have uh, genes which are involved in apoptosis uh, shared with uh, with like all other mammals and then the close relatives of elephants the hyraxes and manatees or the serenians they have duplicated the segment several times and then elephants have duplicated it a whole bunch of times and it is and it is a part of how they uh, don't get cancer very often because elephants are very large don't have a lot of hair and are exposed to the sun constantly so they're should be you know bastions of cancer and yet elephants very rarely get cancer because of this gene duplication event they've just done over and over and over. So anyway, all righty, next, please. All right. So, um, so we've talked about specific types of mutations. So this is one of the, one of the types of effects of mutations. So heterochrony is the changing that is called is changing the timing of development. So the most famous type of of heterochrony is neoteny. I, I would wager it's probably the the easiest to understand. I would also. Tend to Basically, agree. yeah, it, it's just easiest, I think, intuitively to understand. Um, I mean, paramorphosis is kind of the the flip side of that, and it's also not hard. But some of the other ones are kind of like progenesis is kind of difficult to understand. Uh, but regardless, um, so. Yes, you are retaining your juvenile traits into adulthood. So, for instance, uh, salamanders typically have um, gills for a part of their lives, and then uh, during their metamorphosis, they they uh, absorb their gills, and then they live more of a terrestrial life. Axolotls, however, live life entirely aquatically. They never lose their gills. Their their juvenile gills are retained throughout their whole life. Uh, another example, um, you have here these, these brachiopods. Uh, and so you can see kind of in the bottom left of the picture, the juvenile form, and then the bottom right is the adult form. And over time in the fossil record, as we have approached the present more, they have become less and less like the adult, more and more like the juvenile form. They have moved in their morphology more and more towards looking like a juvenile and this is also proposed to have happened in humans there's a bit of debate but generally the consensus seems to agree on uh, humans being essentially neotenic um, apes so we look a lot like baby chimps uh, we are essentially baby chimps that don't grow up we never uh, develop a face that is as prognathic as chimps, gorillas, orangutans, our face stays pretty flat, just like babies. Anything you'd like to add? Um, oh, one fun thing with uh, axolotls is that you can actually give them the hormones that would normally cause a salamander to lose the gills and become an adult. And they will, in fact, become yes. an adult. And they look very, very similar to another species from their uh, native habitat over around uh, Lake Mexico. 
So that's a, a fun little thing there. Which, by the way, don't do that to your yes. ass model. It's actually yeah. very bad for their health, but it's a it's a neat experiment. Yeah, I'm glad it was done. Yeah, yeah, they, they die pretty shortly thereafter. Um, basically, mm -hmm. what they do is they they fail to produce um, like uh, thyroxine and triiodothyronine, which are the the iodine containing uh, hormones that that our bodies make uh, as we you know as we grow and whatnot. And their bodies just don't produce these for whatever reason. Uh, maybe that ability got knocked out by a mutation, who knows? Um, and so they just don't produce that. And then if you give them iodine, like, like Dapper said, then that will kick their, their production into high gear and they will fully metamorphose. Right. So, alrighty, next. I, yeah. As brain bug said, if you want a tiger salamander, just get a tiger salamander. I just realized right, exactly, that. Exactly. Yeah. That if, if, if I'm a baby chimp, I'm literally Peter Pan. Sorry. Yeah, basically. Yeah, that that's works. pretty funny. Yeah, that uh, that's pretty good, Peter. I, I for those of you in the audience, it. a pen is the generic name for the chimpanzee and the bonobo. <laughs> Next. It's always funny when you explain a joke. It's it that makes it funnier. It does. That's, Otherwise, that is you... objectively how jokes become funnier. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Uh, sort of the flip side of the of 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 neoteny and that's not strictly speaking true but it's kind of the opposite is called paramorphosis so basically you continue developing beyond what the adult developed so you still have the same length of lifespan but you do more development during your life essentially and so uh so you see it says a paramorphocline that just means it's increasing in how much paramorphosis is going on um and so you have your um i can't see it i can't see it okay well um these ceratopsians here the cetacosaurus on the far left yeah cetacosaurus um and then brevisceratops and protoceratops so the thing that is growing is the it looks like the frill and the beak basically these are becoming more and more pronounced over time and so the developmental process is just kicking that development of the frill and the beak into higher and higher gear as time is going on, even though the juveniles look pretty similar to each other. I'm going to say that the um, development in the beak is a little bit exaggerated because they're failing to always put the, uh, the divisions between the bones in all the pictures. It's enough. actually not that much of a change. Yeah. Okay, so it's really just the frill. Yeah, basically. basically. Okay. Uh, there's also some change in the, uh, the um, amount of change in the jaw. So you have the Cetacosaurus with mm -hmm. a relatively flat line along the, the dentary going into the other jaw bones, like the serangular and whatnot. Whereas by the time you get to Protoceratops, there's a, a sharp upturn, which is allowing this to uh, attach more muscles that allow the jaw to slide back and forth for chewing. And that gets even more pronounced in Neoceratopsians, which are the... The ceratopsians most people are familiar with, like Cetacos or Styracosaurus, Triceratops, um, stuff mm -hmm. like that. Chasmosaurus. Yeah. Those are the Neoceratopsians. And we have an excellent fossil record for Ceratopsians as a whole. In fact, it's one of the best transitional sequences, but people don't really talk about it much because they're all extinct. And so people tend to talk about like horses and humans and whatnot, which also excellent sequences. But yeah, the Ceratopsian fossil record is amazing. Absolutely. I believe I have another slide much later on where we talk about this, but we'll get to that. Good. More ceratopsians. Uh, <laughs> ceratopsians for everyone. Look under your seats, folks. You get a ceratopsian. <laughs> yeah. um, and then the other uh, example of a paramorphocline is uh, those are sand dollars. Uh, so you're just uh, continuing the development of those little sort of finger-like projections that kind of start on the bottom. Mm. And then sort of by the end, the finger-like projections are just all over what are those for? I don't really know. It's a good question. Okay. Although I do like cool. getting tertiary bilateral symmetry in a secondarily radially symmetric animal. I mean, they start life, you know, as uh, they start life as bilaterally symmetric um, mm -hmm. with their, their little cluteus larvae. And then they, <laughs> you, became, you were bilaterally symmetric, became radial, went back to bilateral symmetry. <laughs> yep. <laughs> why not have a tertiary symmetry, man? Just do it. It's going to be fun. I mean, why not, right? Um, 
All right, next. Animals are whack. <laughs> they, organisms are whack. Organisms are whack. Can can agree. Uh, Hox genes. So another type, uh, another big type of, of, of mutational effect is called a homeotic uh, mutation. And there are different types of what are called homeobox genes. Uh, homeobox genes are genes that have this, this uh, region called the homeobox. It is a regulatory region. It's, I believe it's 180 nucleotides, which translates to 60 amino, acid, amino acids. Um, and one subset of of the homeobox genes are called Hox genes. There's also like the Pax genes and lots and lots of other genes. And so the different, the effects of the different um, or of changing the different Hox genes can be shown here in these different pictures. So the, you have the original at the very top, the very top left where it says a, and then you mutate any of the different Hox genes and you get different uh, leg arrangements, which is, uh, which is a pretty big factor in the evolution of arthropods. In fact, if you look uh, down at sort of C, down the sort of the bottom right, um, you can see how the Hox genes have changed in their expression and have generated uh, different structures. Um, so you see the deletion of abdominal A uh, in the amphipod Perio hawaiiensis results in a phenotype which is similar to that of isopods. So basically amphipods have legs which point like in two different directions. And so if you delete abdominal A, instead of pointing in two different directions, their legs just point in one direction. That's isopod. They're the same legs is what that means. And so that's sort of small scale uh Part of the part of how uh, arthropods have become so um, so diverse is you you mutate the Hox genes and this results in like claws or different pointing legs and stuff like that or new segments, all that sort of fun stuff. Okay. Oh, fun fact: isopods you might know as roly polies or wood lice or yes. pill bugs. They're one of the most successful groups of. Uh, terrestrial crustaceans other than insects which are in fact a kind of crustacean absolutely indeed they are terrestrial crustaceans next so this is just a comparison between three different uh, phyla uh, within panarthropoda and how they use their hox genes differently um, homeo uh, well homeotic mutation or was, was, was originally called a homeosis really refers to um segmental uh, identity change so you've probably heard of antennapedia so instead of the segment becoming a uh, an antenna it became a leg when it was mutated that's what that means that the identity of the segment was changed and that's how researchers originally figured out um what homeobox or, or hox genes were homeobox and hox genes uh although they didn't call them that originally it wasn't until later those terms uh, they came up with those terms because they didn't know what even the structure of DNA was until like the 50s. And then right. Evo Devo didn't really come along until like the 70s. So I do have a quick question, though. How come we don't have an annelid on the far right? Whereas we do have a tardigrade, a myriapod and a nicophorin. He's on the bottom. Oh, you mean the pictures? OK, yes. my bad. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, I know. I know. Uh, what is it? Cancel Jackson. Yeah, Cancel Jackson, Jackson just 2022. Just been forced into an early retirement. So yeah, it's been fun, guys. But it's that's all what over they now. say. My apologies. <laughs> um, and annelid, uh, annelids are these segmented worms. So if you guys want to imagine one, that isn't. Uh, think of your your common earthworm. That is an annelid. So sorry, folks. What about the worms from Tremors? Don't those aren't those like. Uh, have legs as offspring or as juveniles don't didn't they or yeah something? two of their life stages do have legs yeah that's uh i don't think that's an annelid that's a a common annelid trait okay so they may be very highly derived annelids extremely highly derived <laughs> yeah okay. I'm, I'm fine with this <laughs> next please uh uh second verse same as the first um except these are uh, mostly chordates. So um, our relative, or well, I mean, no, they're not all chordates. You have uh, echinoderms at the top. So um, 
the different colored squares are just representing different Hox genes. And as you can see in vertebrates, it has, we have just, just gone crazy with how many Hox genes we have. We've like quadruplicated the number of Hox genes. That's involved um, in what I was talking about, where there are a lot of whole genome duplications in the history of life. That can get you yes. things like duplicate Hox genes, which can then go on to create ever more complicated body plants because, I mean, that's what they do. Absolutely. Next slide, please. All right. So I think we kind of get, or I think we, we basically have an understanding of how mutations work and what the effects of mutations can be. So when mutations happen, these result in different phenotypes. And as Dapper pointed out earlier, phenotype is just the, uh, the, out, the, the outward expression of your, your genome, right? Your genotype. And so that expression is all of your, your proteins and all the functions that they do, which generate your, your morphology, your, all your body parts, your behaviors and everything. And so when you change uh, a gene or a genetic sequence, it results or can result in a different morphology. And humans acknowledged this a long time ago, uh, broadly speaking, and they realized that individuals have variations. And if we only allow the individuals with the variations that we like to breed, then we will get more individuals with those variations. They figured this out a long, long time ago. We're talking like 10,000 plus years ago. <laughs> And yeah, we've been basically. doing it ever since. That's how we have agriculture. That's how we have, you know, uh, cows and uh, domesticated cows and horses and dogs and, and all this and pigeons. Because we realize that fact. It's, it's not a difficult fact to, you know, to realize. If cavemen can do it, so can you, basically. I don't know. Uh, cavemen are really good at napping flint, and I really suck at it. So maybe. I mean, you only have like four total fingers, don't you, or something like that? Well, no, I have eight total fingers, but yeah, okay, one of them is kind of a little stubby and doesn't have a claw, so it's like six functional fingers. <laughs> I can understand how that would make things a little bit more difficult. Yeah, that's true. Also, I can't pronate my wrists, which is a little bit of a problem. <laughs> Might need that. Um, all right, next, please. And here's just another example of that. This is uh, with goldfish. So uh, Carassius aratus is the common uh, goldfish, or uh, it's not called that, it's the Crucian carp. And so we took the Crucian carp and, well, really the, the Chinese took the Crucian carp and, and uh, are first known to have come up with the different, with different, uh, breeds of goldfish and we've just gone from there and some have dorsal fins some don't some have big telescopic eyes some don't some have you know some are orange some are black some are brown just lots of different colors so next slide okay so here's a more recent example of this process artificial selection so in this example researchers what they were trying to do and you can of course read all that if you want uh or you know, find the paper because it, it's down there. Uh, researchers ba were basically tr uh, trying to get um, E. coli to uh, evolve a a gene that could excise a segment of DNA. Now they uh, they um, are unable to do this originally or normally, and so researchers had to find a gene which was uh, which was uh, similar. Oh, they had to find. Uh, yeah, that's right. That's what it was. So they, they took this this uh, recombinase, which cuts out uh, regions of the of the genome, uh, and they evolved it to remove HIV DNA. So basically, the researchers evolved this E. coli to rec to become better and better at recognizing a genetic sequence, so that it could remove that. Right. And so um, this it didn't take very long. It, I think it only took like 100 or so generations, something like that. Just not very many. That's like some meta level artificial breeding. Yeah, it's it 
it's pretty crazy. It did not take very long. Um, but, but that's the point. It's the, it just kept mutating, right? The researchers don't control which mutations occur. They can only select which products are produced. So they just kept choosing the ones who were progressively better at excising this region of the genome until they got essentially perfect at it. So I think that's a really cool experiment and, you know, feel free to go read that paper. It's really neat. So next, please. Just don't use Sci-Hub okay. to access it for free because you're taking uh, food off the table of poor starving journal editors. And yeah, awesome. definitely don't use Sci-Hub. Just, yeah. just don't don't use Sci-Hub or Z Library or Archive.org. Right. I think uh, the Sci-Hub is with a dash between the Sci and the Hub, so definitely yeah. make sure you don't don't do that. Um, definitely don't type in S C I dash H U B. Just don't do it. Mm -hmm. Don't even think about doing it. You know, science so. is not supposed to be open access. It is supposed to be closed <laughs> off and only available to a certain number of people who either pay through the nose or happen to be employees of certain institutions. That's how exactly. science is supposed to work. Exactly. That's what we're saying. Uh, here are a couple more experiments. So, um, Am I seeing snowflake yeast? You are seeing snowflake yeast. In fact, awesome. we discussed this topic at length in a recent video. We did. You can find it on both of our channels. But since we're on Jackson's Wheat channel, you should watch that one. <laughs> Um, so in, in that instance, uh, these researchers, um, evolved, uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is your the the best baker's yeast. Yep. Um, and it became multicellular due to some, due to some mutations that it acquired. So they selected for yeast that were, that were uh, ever faster at settling out in a solution. And the way that these yeast were able to settle out the fastest was they became multicellular. They had mutations, which um, essentially um, broke a gene involving or that is involved in uh, separating um, uh, cells that underwent mitosis, which is what they're normally supposed to do. But these don't, they stick together. And so they would settle out faster. They become heavier and would sink to the bottom faster. Um, and we'll, we'll talk more about that one in a moment. Um, the other one, Heron et al. 2019, uh, involved chlamydomonas, which is an algae, and it became multicellular in response to predation. So this this uh, predator, quote quote, Ochromonas, uh, which is eating an algae. So doesn't th doesn't that make it an herbivore rather than a predator? <laughs> Look, herbivores are just plant predators, man. I mean, I you know that's that's fair. So there you go. <laughs> yeah. Um. So normally. Uh, just like with the yeast, these guys are unicellular. These guys are ancestrally unicellular. Um, both Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Chlamydomonas reinhardi are unicellular, and then they, you know, they they reproduce. They uh, undergo mitosis and they split off from each other. But in this case, that uh, didn't happen. They stuck together and they became too large for Ochromonas to eat. Uh, but interestingly, at first there was there were so many of them. Or there, there was a such a big diversity, an array of different sizes of these chlamydomonas that there was then selective pressure for clusters that were not too large, uh, such that nutrients couldn't be distributed to all of their their member cells, but also not too small, such that they were eaten by ochromonas. So there was experimentation in all sorts of directions, which then homed in on one particular. Uh, phenotype it's like a population was trying to find some kind of fitness peak via a random walk through mutation all almost yeah crazy that's getting it probably passed like you know the basics of evolution though <laughs> <laughs> yeah well we'll we'll talk about uh yeah we'll talk about some of that we're, gonna, we're actually gonna touch on fitness landscapes i mean in a broad sense uh, I mean, I guess we can talk about that right now. Um, the fitness landscape was a uh, was an analogy that was invented by, uh, well, it's attributed to JBS Haldane. It, for everything that someone, you know, like invented an idea, there's always like someone else you can find who also had that idea. It's around probably like one time. of his PhD students who he didn't bother to credit. 
<laughs> yeah, probably. Um, I know. Stay mad, JBS Haldane. <laughs> so, uh, the idea of the 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 fitness landscape is um, rather than um, if you consider uh, think of natural selection like as as a as a landscape. It has hills and it has valleys and and uh, plains. Well, if you have mutations, they can push you up or down or across these these different um, features of the landscape. Um, uh, for instance, if you're there's and there's a book uh, by Richard Dawkins which majorly plays on this analogy. It's called Climbing Mount Improbable, and the the easiest way to conceptualize this is it's really hard to go up a steep cliff face, right? Like, it'd be really hard to just jump from the bottom all the way to the top of the mountain. But it'd be a lot easier to go up a, a sort of gentle cliffside. So instead of these macro mutations, in a sense, which jump you all the way up the mountain, it typically evolution is going to proceed by small incremental mutations, which gradually build up. And that's... Uh, and that was sort of worked out conceptually by Darwin and then mathematically by Ronald Fisher and the other population geneticists in the 1930s. But typically you have smaller mutations because the larger a mutation is, the more likely you're going to screw something up. So uh, anything to add to that? Oh, sorry. After I unmute myself. Uh, no, I think that that covers it pretty well. Okay. Next slide, polls. So we also talked about this recently. Um, so this is so the researchers who did that yeast experiment sort of continued uh, with that experiment, and what they did uh, or what they found was that if you continue this this um, this experiment long enough, your your yeast not only become multicellular but actually macroscopic, which is kind of wild. Very. Um, and so they they actually sequenced the genome. Oh, and I had the guy on who did this experiment, or one of the guys who did this experiment, uh, William Ratcliffe. Uh, so see that interview if you want to know more about, about this experiment. Or the talk Dapper and I had where we discussed this in detail. We actually read the paper <laughs> that described this, this Crazy, experiment. Crazy, right? I actually sat down yeah. and read a paper. Actually, yeah, I do that very often. Um, and so the researchers actually sequenced the genome of the... Um, of the 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 yeast and figured out exactly which mutations in were involved in uh the elongation of the cells and then uh you know not uh, breaking apart and all that sort of stuff and it's really cool like i said go read that paper if you're interested in all that sort of stuff next slide please All right, and something you can go check out Dapper Dinosaur's channel for is the, the evolution of antibiotic resistance, because I believe you've done several videos on this topic now. Oh, we're going to be doing several more in the coming weeks there, Jackson. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, exactly right. Um, because make you suffer through Dr. Charles Jackson's talk about antibiotic resistance. <laughs> um, some people seem to think that and the evolution of antibiotic resistance is not a um, is is not a good piece of evidence for evolution. When in fact it is, it's actually really good evidence for evolution because I mean it is evolution. It li quite literally is definitionally evolution. It is a change in allele frequencies in a population over generations. Yep. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's sort of like a Coke bottle is really good evidence for the existence of soda. Yeah, because that's <laughs> what that is. <laughs> um, this and so that picture on the left uh, just shows that one of the, the concepts that we discuss a lot because the person we referring to does not seem to understand this concept is the idea of mutation saturation. Uh, so basically, in within a, a population of a given size and given a genome of a certain size, um, your population can exceed the size of your genome in, in, in number. And when that happens, you necessarily or, or you likely necessarily have a uh, mutation 
for every nucleotide. Every single point mutation has been exhausted. And that's true of us, of humans. Uh, we have, our genome is, was it 6.4 billion uh, base pairs? That's our diploid genome. And there are... Yeah, that sounds about... Oh, no, is that the haploid or the diploid? I can't remember. I think that's diploid. I think it's... I think Either it's way, we're it's still it's... well into... Even if that's the haploid yeah. genome, which would mean that, you know, the diploid genome is twice as big, we're still well yeah. into um, mutation saturation either way, because yes. we're quite a ways past the minimum for uh, mutation saturation as a human species. Right, because every single person is born with about 100 mutations. Well, just by the time you're a zygote, you have about 100 novel mutations. So 100 times 8 billion, that's 800 billion. And so even if you know, our genome is like, what, 12 billion base pairs. We are still many times over, you know, saturated uh, the, the mutations for that. So so anyway, um, so in this instance, uh, or in the, the picture on the on the, the right, you have the wild type bacteria and uh, penicillins were utilized in in an industrial scale and as a result bacteria developed uh, beta lactamases so they can now destroy the penicillin they have modified their enzymes in such a way that penicillin is not going to kill them anymore and so we came up with new antibiotics to try to kill them such as uh like beta lactamase inhibitors and cephalosporins but guess what they came the the bacteria came up with yet more ways to get around that such as the uh, ampc and these other and these are other um uh beta lactamases i think uh like tem and so we came with yet more antibiotics like carbapenem and guess what now the bacteria have carbapenemases who could have seen that coming and so if you're a certain person who's inclined to say just treat everything with broad spectrum antibiotics reconsider please yeah that's a really really bad idea that. If you have Which no idea again, what we're talking about. Yeah. Sorry, okay. reference to, to our show on my channel, Jackson with Jackson, where Dr. Charles Jackson, the man we were responding to, suggested that maybe broad spectrum antibiotics should be the the default treatment for all bacterial infections, which is just a bad idea. Please, please, any any medical professionals, um, go look at your own recommendations and you'll find that uh, that they tend to agree with me that broad spectrum antibiotics is sort of a last resort kind of thing. And it really shouldn't be used for every infection. Yeah, no, no, definitely not. So let's, uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I just saw Ray Rard's comment. He said, poor goldfish have to live like that. Yep, indeed. Yeah, they get fed though. So they don't have to work very hard. <laughs> That's true. But God, are they ugly? All right. Next slide, please. To each other. <laughs> okay. So we talked about artificial selection. So, that's humans controlling which members of the population get to survive and reproduce. Now, humans have no control over which mutations are produced. Those are largely stochastic, but we do have a hand at, but you know, we do have a hand in which guys get to survive. Now in natural selection, humans have no part in this process. This is just which variations the environment is allowing to survive is allowing to uh, to continue and be passed on. So natural selection is about death. So we've talked about how variations are generated by mutation and recombination. Natural selection is about culling those variations because not, not all, and in fact, probably most of those variations aren't beneficial at the very least. May, they may not be harmful, most of them. But the vast gonna majority neutral. are going to be neutral. The vast majority. Right. So they're, yeah. So they're they're not uh, they're not going to help one way or the other. And so uh, individuals are eliminated from the gene pool. That means they can no longer pass on their particular sets of alleles by a variety of means, including lack of resources, predators, parasites, or parasitoids, uh, epidemics such as you know the one we're going through right now, etc. So individuals can compete within a species. So if you have, say, two males fighting over a limited number of females, that's intraspecific competition. And if you have individuals competing between species, like maybe two species of deer 
you know, or a species of deer and a species of bovid, for instance, competing over the same grassland. Now, competition does not necessarily mean fighting. Understand that. Competition can mean one of them is better than the other at processing food. If, um, you know, if cows, for instance, are faster at, at processing grass than deer are, then the cows are going to outcompete the deer for the grass resource. That's why deer so, tend to eat like, you know, bushes. Right. So they're not fighting over the grass. They're, they are the deer outcompeted simply because the cows are better at their niche, their particular niche, which is a grazer rather than being a browser. And so this idea of, of one uh, species out competing another is called competitive exclusion principle. That's what that is. And so a way to get around this is one species has uh, mutations which allow it to focus on a different niche. So instead of both deer and cows being grazers in the same area, maybe the population of deer has mutations that uh, predispose them towards being browsers instead. And so that way, they're not competing for the same resources. They can live happily side by side and not compete with each other. And that's called niche differentiation or niche divergence or niche partitioning. I've seen all of those terms, so I just threw them all there just in case. I happen to like niche, niche partitioning. It's a good one because partitioning yep. is a cool word. It is a cool word. All right, next, please. Be, before you go to the next one, uh, I I want to yes, uh, sir. I I want to do some niche participation because you started out with, um, and I'm the niche. So um, you started out with saying natural selection. That is where humans don't have a hand in in things. Is that correct? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, so artificial selection was about I, I, I get it. I get it. I get it. Bear, bear with me. What is one of okay. the most common things that creationists will attack when it comes to natural selection? They've got their their slides prepared. So, what is one of the species uh, that is? I don't know. What is it? Uh, the peppered moth. Well, we we may talk about that momentarily. Well, I just wanted to point out that mayhaps that humans may have had a hand in why the okay, darker. Okay, I see what you're saying. <laughs> That's okay. true. I see what you're saying. Okay, well, let me rephrase in that case. Um, I win. Well, like I like I said <laughs> earlier, um, yeah, I mean, humans are not intentionally selecting <laughs> the organisms in this <laughs> case in the case of natural selection if humans are involved at all okay. is that better yeah yeah I'll, I'll i appreciate <laughs> your i appreciate your nuance on the situation my niece but niche participation okay exactly all right next please okay so here's an example or a bunch of examples of of uh niche partitioning so all, all those... with dinosaurs. Well, almost all with dinosaurs. Yeah, those those theropods up in the top left, those are all uh, different shorebirds inhabiting different niches. So some of them are uh, looking maybe for isopods in the sand. Some are maybe picking out like uh, oysters. Some are eating, you know, fish. Some are filter feeding shrimp. They're all after different foods and they're all living in different areas of you know, the surf where they where they feed as their different niches. So they're not having to compete with each other for the same food sources. Um, and with the sauropods on the bottom, those are from I can't I have no idea how to pronounce that formation. It's from Argentina. Maybe you do dapper. Uh, uh, so I don't really speak Portuguese and I'm but wean cool would be my best approximation. That that's actually how I typically tend to pronounce it. So we'll go with that. Yeah, we heard cool here first. Um, but don't take our word for it. Yeah, please don't. Neither of us speak Portuguese, so you know. Uh, but in this formation, oh, I forgot. After I say, don't take our word for it. I'm supposed to say, da -dun -dun. you know, 
reading Rainbow. Go watch it, guys. It's really good. But don't take my word for it. So the sauropods on the bottom are from this formation, uh, which is in the Cretaceous. They're all titanosaurs. These sauropods need to put on some weight. And Yeah, they're shrink-wrapped. Yeah, they're very babies. shrink-wrapped. Um, I didn't come up with the picture. Look at those coracoids. My goodness, there's no muscle on them. What's the coracoid <laughs> for if there's not going to be muscle on it? <laughs> You're ridiculous. Uh, but in this formation, you have large sauropods like Argentinosaurus, medium Size sauropods like Andesaurus, and then the smaller sauropods like Limesaurus. And so they're all presumably feeding on different plants so that they are not overlapping in their niches. And they're not eating um, the, the same foods, not having to compete with each other. And then there are the, the some, some paramecium in the top uh, right. And so with that, that's a reference to the experiments done by, uh, I think it, it was ghosts or Goss from like the 1920s and 30s, and he was um, experimenting with Paramecia to show the competitive exclusion principle. So the blue outcompeted the the red uh, Paramecia. Or you have the niche partitioning where they are living in different areas. Maybe the blue is, or it tends to be more um, uh, anoxic or anoxygenic, and so it prefers the bottom half of the, of the tube while... The red is more oxygenic. It prefers the top half. And you can do experiments like that, I think, in microbiology, where you'll have this, this partitioning of the different uh, uh, different bacteria based on their metabolic processes. So, all righty. Ready? Next slide, please. All right, so... Um, Another way that natural selection can occur is through the generation of what are called ecotypes. So organisms don't always necessarily have to compete. Um, they can also just, as they spread out over an area, over different um, areas, those areas can undergo different climates, can be uh, susceptible to different climates. And so some may end up in a slightly drier or a slightly wetter location, slightly cooler, slightly warmer. And so these, these uh, different um, climates are going to have an effect on the growth of the organism. And so if they maybe don't survive very well when they first enter this area, maybe if they don't go extinct, then they develop some mutations which help them survive better. And as you can see, these uh, plants, uh, potent, uh, or say, uh, Achillea, are growing at two different heights based on you know, where they're living relative to these um, these altitudes. So, alrighty. Next, please. All right. So, oh, hey, it's the that wild. slide that we were just talking about. Peter, are you are you a psychic? How did uh, you know? I'm. I'm. So, I'm not only an amateur magician. I'm also an amateur mentalist, and nice. so I have my tricks. This sounds like it might have been a hot reading situation, but I don't know. It it, <laughs> it might have been that that I've I've had this PowerPoint presentation for a few months. So I may, <laughs> yeah, that sounds I, like a hot, I, that's I a may, hot reading. I may have browsed a bit. Cheater. Fair enough. Um, so, so as, as we mentioned earlier, the, the example of the peppered moth. So in this instance, so, I mean, this is a super famous one, but if you haven't heard of it very briefly, what happened was the industrial revolution, the biggest mistake in human history. <laughs> I'm just Bean kidding. Sorry, factories. Um, so, uh, so you have the industrial revolution and as a result of the industrial revolution, you have all these new factories, which are getting built. And this is putting out lots of soot and smoke in the environment. And it's coating the trees and rocks and, and plants in this soot and, and people. ash. And people, yeah, there had to be a legislation in, in, in Europe to like clean up the rivers and stuff. It got pretty bad. Um, oh, yeah. And courts so, stopped accepting nuisance lawsuits, which would have helped. But they were like, nah, industrialization, more important. Let's uh, let's yeah. stop finding for people for nuisance damages. 
Right. Yeah. There's a whole lot of uh, corruption going on. You know, that's that's what happens. That's government for you. But a- anyways, um, so these these moths are this this uh, peppered moth based on Betularia is typically kind of white with little black speckles, and they uh, sit on trees and grass and rocks. And yes, we have seen them sitting on all of these, and there are pictures of all of them. Some people are under the bizarre idea that these moths had to be like glued to rocks and trees and stuff, and that's because moths. No. It's well known that moths don't land. I, they continually fly forever. Life on the wing. That's how they do. <laughs> right. They never rest. They never stop. That's that's mm-hmm. how that happens. Very impressive. Uh, sorry, sorry, folks. Okay. Anyway, um, so I, um, I've, I've also the I've also heard operation. that they were pinned to trees, which then it leads yeah, me to a... conclude that it's easier to pin down a peppered moth than an ID proponent. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but also, so one of the things is that these rumors occur because there were, in fact, some stage photos with dead moths that were pinned to mm. sur- surfaces. But that's because it this ha- was it things that were done in, like, the early, like, the late 19th, early 20th century, when you had to have an exposure time that no moth was going to sit for. It doesn't mean the moths weren't observed resting in these areas. It just means that when you have to take a 10-minute exposure, you cannot rely on a live moth to stand still for 10 minutes. It's literally not going to happen. Yeah. So, yes, in order to get photographs, some of them were staged using dead moths. But it was illustrative. It wasn't presented as the evidence. It was like, hey, these moths are camouflaged differently. Here's an example of how. Right, exactly. Yeah. Um, and interestingly, there was a book written about this experiment by a guy named Michael Majerus. Um, and Michael Majerus wrote about the original um, peppered moth um, uh, experiment and documents and all that uh, by Kettlewell from the early 1900s, as you were saying. And uh, Majerus pointed out that there were uh, some methodological issues with the original experiment, but some people took this to mean that the results of the original peppered moth experiments were therefore uh, inconclusive or wrong, which was not at all Majerus's point. So Majerus went out and redid the experiment and got the same results. Yeah. Turns out that just because something is methodologically flawed, that doesn't necessarily mean the conclusion is wrong. It just means you need to do better to make sure. Right, exactly. And so... So, yeah, so no, it's still true. And it turns out at this point, researchers have pinned down basic approximately the year that the mutation occurred, which caused the 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 melanistic uh, version. It was in the early it was like around 1820, something like that. Um, And they even figured out which specific mutation it was. It was a transposon. So a jumping gene which landed in a regulatory region, which essentially caused the overproduction of this this uh, melanism which is why they're black. So, but so natural selection. So, uh, caused these, this melanistic, uh, morph to reach almost fixation because they were much better camouflaged against the soot and ash covered, uh, plants and rocks than the original form. And then when the laws went into effect that brought the amount of, of ash and soot in the environment back down, the white moths, return or white morphs returned in force and now they're predominantly white morphs again so so that's we should, natural we should selection lift those laws temporarily just to see if it happens again new experiment <laughs> i don't know about that but i mean sure there's gonna be a whole lot more lung cancer and stuff but like ah, I, it's just people right you know we're worried about the moths here exactly um another uh sort of similar experiment uh or well uh, observation was made with mice in Nebraska. So there are these, um, there's this like area that's got uh, this quartz sand. So the, the quartz sand is, is very light colored compared to the surrounding darker colored sediment. And so researchers took the light colored mice from the, the, the light substrate and put them in the dark substrate and across the other mice. And what they found was that the mice with darker colors fared much worse in the light colored substrate and the same and the the lighter colored mice fared much worse in the dark substrate 
almost like you would you would expect. And so the the so as you can see, natural selection clearly occurred because these guys are and they're the same species. They're just different morphs of the same species. So. All right. Uh, but Jackson, remember, species don't really exist. That's fair. You got me there. I did say that earlier. So and I, I got myself, I guess. Yeah. So <laughs> got correct. me. Yeah. Time to, um, to retire for the fifth time or something. I know. I'm just I'm constantly retiring. And then I come back from retirement and I'm forced to retire again. It's, it's a rough life. Uh, all right. Next slide, please. All right, so camouflage. Um, so natural selection happens and organisms develop adaptations. We, and in some cases, in really good cases, we can actually figure out which specific mutations contribute to those adaptations. Now that you know genetic sequencing and genomic sequencing is a thing and not that hard to do anymore. It's not like you have to get thousands of dollars to sequence one organism's genome. You can actually do it relatively easily. Um, and so, uh, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll make that note right now. Uh, we are not going to go through this whole thing. We are going to go up. We're just going to go for the next half an hour. We'll see how far we get. Uh, do you mind coming back on in the future, Dapper, to do the rest of this? Hmm, good question. Um, I like no, to I think, think about I'm, it. By I think the I'm end. good. I think I'm good. You think you're Although, good? You, you would, wouldn't yeah, want to do I it think again? I'm okay. To, I'm, I think I'm okay to come back again. I do okay, want to know, right. though, what, what genus of dinosaur we have at the lower left of the middle picture. Oh, that is a Borealopelta. Borealopelta? Borealopelta? No, that's on the right. On the left, we have an unidentified uh, theropod that looks kind of like a Megaraptorid, which is not a good fit for Borealopelta. I don't know. I also, don't you know. have Nodosaurus? Is that a Nodosaurus that you have on top? That's the actual, that's the actual uh, fossil of Borrelia pelta. Are we sure that's not a notosaurus? It is a notosaurid. I mean, Borrelia oh, pelta. Oh, yes, is notosaurine. A yeah, it is. It is Borrelia pelta. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but so, uh, so organisms adapt. They uh, develop adaptations. We can figure out which, um, which uh, uh, mutations contribute to which particular phenotypes, but. Uh, it's not enough to just have one little uh, adaptation. As we said, uh, organisms, you know, they walk through this this uh, fitness landscape, so they have m more mutations over generations. And so, um, and we'll, we'll talk about evolutionary arms races in a moment. But you can have this buildup. Organisms can get uh, more and more mutations, which push them in a particular direction. You can have natural selection which pushes these organisms in a particular direction until they get really, really good at some particular niche. Um, and so one of those examples is camouflage. So you see some different mantids down there on the, the left. That's a good question, Brainbug. I do not know the answer. I apologize. Um, I just thought it was a cool You got to read the show. question for people who, who aren't. Oh, sorry. Uh, it says is that, Brainbug says is that Dara Plates Desicata. And the answer is, I do not know. Could and he's be. talking about the bug because it's Brainbug. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. She's talking about the bug because it's a Brainbug. Uh, you sorry. could be correct, Brainbug. Uh, I, I just don't know. Um, you are encouraged to look it up uh, and then come back to us. Tell, tell me if it's correct. Um, on top, it's a sand dab. It is a type of flatfish. And then Borealopelta Pelta has. Uh, is the the notosaurid on the, the bottom and that had these and it turns out because researchers um that the the preservation of this notosaurid is so good that actually some of its the the molecules some of its original molecules are actually preserved with it and so we can see its original coloration which is pretty darn cool if you ask me agreed it, it's unusual it's becoming a little bit more common, but um, yeah, it's still very rare. Yeah, and then Hippocampus barjabanti, which is a seahorse, um, and it's uh, it's on a type of coral which has the same little like white with red bumps that it has. Uh, so uh, natural selection has has continually honed 
these organisms over generations to get better and better at at um uh, looking like something whether it's sand or leaves or coral so all right next slide please And then yet more examples of camouflage. You got the peacock Katie did, which obviously looks like a dead leaf. The leaf insect philium, Amazon leaf fish. Interestingly, that that picture is Jerry Coyne's hand. He took that picture holding all those fish. So interesting fun little fact. Uh, yeah. Um, and then Philocrissa down there. It is. It looks like a. Um, um, it looks like a, a like a, a moss, which is really cool fun fact so it's way cooler to be a bug that looks like a moth than to be a moss <laughs> i guess so um and so yeah so yeah these these organisms have been honed by natural selection simply by uh needing to survive and having mutations that make them look like things in their environment and that has pushed them uh ever farther towards looking like plants so there's no consciousness involved in this. Humans are not picking these. This is just the environment selecting these organisms. Because it turns out, if you look like things in your environment that aren't tasty to predators, they're going to leave you alone. Who would have thunk it? So. All right, next slide, please. Mimicry. All right, so... Um, so... Mimicry is when... Uh, Organisms evolve to look like other organisms, or they adapt to look like other organisms. So, in this, so in this uh, picture, you have uh, on the top there that little picture is um, Canthogaster valentini, the um, the sharp nosed pufferfish, and the one right below it is a mimic leather jacket filefish. So, the pufferfish is poisonous. In case you guys did not know that, uh, you guys have probably heard of like fugu before. Uh, pufferfish have to be prepared in a certain way or you will die. It will be your last meal. Not even your intended last meal. Um, would be an interesting request for a last meal, though. It, yeah. I'm go on my own terms by eating a bunch of fugu. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, you know, a paralytic, so you would be paralyzed and then eventually, like, suffocate. So that wouldn't be super fun. It's a good idea, but, like, <laughs> I don't know. I'm not on death row. I'm not going to tell people on death row what to do. I, I fair enough, I guess. Uh, so, so the the file fish is a tasty fish, though. File fish are tasty to lots of fish, and so researchers were trying to figure out: Hey, is it is it in fact the case that looking slightly like a puffer fish confers some degree of protection? Mm. Because clearly, it you know these guys look very similar to each other. Their colorations are very very similar. But is it in fact the case that if you just look kind of like a puffer fish, does that help you survive at all? And so the researchers tested this. So they constructed a series of models. So you have the one on the very bottom, which is sort of like a normal little gray fish. And as you move up, the models get increasingly more like uh, the puffer fish. Um, and so what the researchers found was, and if you look at that chart on the right, is that as uh, your coloration becomes more like that of a, of a puffer fish, the attacks on you decrease. How interesting. Weird. I actually kind of have that backwards. It's it's more like, in this case, the less you look like a puffer fish, the more you get attacked. Right, right. Yeah, sorry. But, um, but yeah, crazy. Also, in evolutionary biology, this is the sincerest form of flattery. <laughs> absolutely yeah so so um so the cool thing about this is this is this is introducing the concept of adaptability at all stages right for something to evolve in uh, or for something to evolve it has to be beneficial at every stage it can't be harmful at some stage and still you know have a selective advantage for that's that's not how that works right um, and so it turns out that looking a little bit more like a puffer fish and then a little bit more and a little bit more is each a little bit better than the last. 
And so they're getting progressively better uh, in terms of fitness for these organisms. All right, ready? ready? Next slide, please. And so that brings us to the concept of evolutionary arms races. Again, every stage has to be adaptively beneficial. So cheetahs and gazelles. So um, you have your, your gazelles, and they are trying to survive. They're trying to outrun cheetahs, but cheetahs are also trying to get their dinner. Mm -hmm. And so both are adapting to each other. Maybe gazelles adapt you know, slightly longer legs. And then cheetahs in turn also adapt slightly longer legs. And longer and, tails. And longer, longer tails, yeah. Uh, or, no, that's, you know, a, that's a significant part of cheetah adaptation. That that way, the yeah. tail is what helps them turn corners because uh, without mm -hmm. it, they would have a much wider turn radius than the gazelle and they would be very hard pressed to catch a gazelle that just does one switchback. Yeah, exactly. Um, Fun facts about cheetahs. Yeah, fun fact about cheetahs. Um, but also, you know, gazelles may also adapt, um, you know, novel strategies for predator avoidance, and maybe cheetahs adapt, you know, novel strategies for strategies for sneaking up on gazelles, and it's just back and forth and back and forth. They're constantly trying to out evolve the other. Not intentionally, of course. This is all unintentional. It's simply the individuals who have these variations are more likely to survive and reproduce than those who don't. And the cuckoos, uh, cuckoos are a really cool example. I really like brood parasites. They're just, they're weird. Brood parasites are very strange. Um, odd thing to like, but okay. You what? I said odd thing to like, but okay. I mean, yeah, because they're, so brood parasites, um, will lay their eggs in the nest of other birds and get the other birds to raise their offspring. Cuckoos do this, and their offspring end up being like way larger than the the um you know than the the other offspring that the the bird would normally have. But the the bird parent, the erstwhile bird parent, just is like, well, there's a gaping mouth in my nest that must be my baby. And so it's kind of cool how cuckoos have have hijacked this you know this process yeah birds are kind of stupid when it comes to nesting the the default strategy that birds have kind of gone with is if it's in the nest it's mine if it's not mm -hmm. it isn't so like right. if you if a baby bird falls out of a nest if it's early enough there's a fair chance that the parents won't recognize that that happened or similarly with eggs they'll attack they'll go crazy if they see someone trying to take the eggs but like say now the eggs are gone they're just lying around. The birds don't care. It's it's kind of weird thing, and also it's why you can do things like if the the parent birds are gone and you just lay a gigantic egg in their nest, they'll just come back and like, well, it's in my nest, so mm -hmm. it's mine. Yeah. So I mean, it's my nest, right? So that must be my egg. Sure, it couldn't possibly fit out of me, but eh, those are minor details. Yeah, it's the the cool thing is. Um... There are birds who have adapted strategies uh, to combat the cuckoos. So birds that nest in large groups are much uh, better at uh, telling which offspring are theirs. Mm. And so if a cuckoo tries to lay an egg in a nest in one of those nests, they're like, oh, no, hold on a second. This isn't my egg. But as a oh. result, <clears throat> a certain sorry, I was clearing my throat. Um, but as a result, um, cuckoos, or some species have in turn, uh, they have evolved to have their eggs look more similar to those of the colonial birds. So there's this back and forth. Now, what were you saying? Yeah, I was also going to point out that living in a group, it's easier to raise the alarm when a cuckoo shows up. Right. Exactly. Which also helps. But can I so share again, my, my favorite beneficial... example of, a, of an arms race? Did, did you know that, oh, that there's what a, is that there's there's a plant that uh has acquired the ability to walk you know that i have a not heard of that has walking acquired the plant. ability to walk yes do tell peter is it's it called it, tree beard it is the banana plant and and you can you can check this uh when so people who uh uh 
produce our bananas, uh, take that into consideration. So over their lifetime, they walk a couple of feet. And scientists have hypothesized is that they acquired this ability through the evolutionary process in order to get away from Ray Comfort, but that's not confirmed yet. <laughs> wow. Also, it is true wow, that banana plants do do wow. something called walking, which yes. is when they are harvested, um, they tend to send up new shoots with a directional preference, which then means that overall, like the average location of like the center of mass of the plant shifts over time. Yep. So that is a thing. Uh, it's not terrestrial locomotion in the traditional sense, but like it, it does result in the plant slowly moving as it's harvested. So. Yeah, I just I just found it funny that it is the banana. So, yeah, obviously you're, yeah, you're going you're to make get away that from great comfort. Yes, man, the atheist nightmare. So funny. The <laughs> banana, the artificially selected. Caught me off guard with that one. I mean, it is intelligently designed, right? I'll give you that. Yep. Well, it it absolutely is. Yeah, I mean, you pick the one thing that is actually intelligently. <laughs> The yes. Chihuahua, how could that evolve? Anyways, all right. Through natural Next. selection. It couldn't, right? It didn't. <laughs> yep, that's not how that happened. Ooh. Next slide, please. Oh, we're, we're just skipping past all these arthropods? All right, so we have a whole bunch. Oh, we're not skipping past them. Okay. No. Okay, good. Because I was, yeah, I was working for Brain Bug. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, so... Um, so evolutionary arms races have produced lots of of armaments in different organisms, um, but also some of these armaments are being used in sexual selection. So don't just assume they're all for defense. Uh, probably most of them are also or double as as uh, mating devices. That's the case for a lot of those so, beetle. Uh, uh, but you can see trilobites. That is absolutely the case for a lot of those beetle guys. Yeah. Um, I happen to know ha -ha, from my own uh, thesis stuff. But anyways, um, so you got trilobites up there on the, the top left. With, there's like Wallace Serops, which is that guy with a little trident on his nose, which I, I think that. is really cool. Yeah, yeah that's that's whack. Um, then you have a variety of different crustaceans below that, like uh, you got Lobsters, crabs, isopods, all sorts of different guys. I think it's all um, crustaceans after the trilobites. Beetle. Yeah, I mean, on the bot, yeah, uh, both B and C under that are, those are all. Uh, as well as A, B, C, D, and E on the other side. Insects are crustaceans, uh, I mean, Jackson. Pan crustacea, I mean, pan crustacea, crustacea. Crustaceans are not is not a, a clade, I'm but pan crustacea is a clade. Sure, insects nest within crustacea, don't they? Though, maybe I'm wrong. They, they nest within pan crustacea. Same thing. Because, like Thecostraca, for instance, uh, the barnacles are more closely related to like insects than they are to what is it like fairy shrimp or things like that. Anyways, regardless, um, mm, you got a bunch of different seems beetles. To put insects mostly... inside crustaceans, but okay. Those we'll are pan crustaceans. We'll debate it later. Uh, um, uh, so we have uh, a lot of like scarabate beetles who have all sorts of different armaments. Some have like pinchers and horns. And some of these uh, help with um, digging burrows or males fighting over females. Um, you know, all that sort of stuff. So and then you got a couple more little arthropods down at the very bottom. Like I see the giraffe weevil, which is the guy with the very long neck in uh, E. Okay, next slide, please. And then we have we've moved on to uh, vertebrates. So different fish. So you've got like swordfish, sawfish. I see paddlefish up there. Um, and below that you have some, there's some jawless fish. Yeah, you got some some jaw. You got a yeah, some kind of of uh, like placoderm with like a spine on its head. <laughs> so that's wild. Um, oh, it's like sharks have spines, or some sharks have spines. Hey, you put in a ceratosaurus for me. Yeah. Yep, just for you. I, I knew just, you'd just be. Um, it, Although Emlyn two thousand eight did not actually write this. It was me. 
I, obviously. I did this just for you, Dapper. Well, you were the illustrator. But also, our, our exactly. tetrapod section, it starts off with a bunch of dinosaurs. But then also we have, like, a Dicynodon and Diplocolis. And then farther down, there's, like, uh, an Aedosaur. Yeah, I didn't, it's, it's very confusing. I didn't group. make it. <laughs> yeah, I didn't make it. I see, yeah, like, multiple amphibians in there, some synapsids. Um, yeah, you're right. Some crocodilians or crocodilomorphs or, you know, uh, pseudosuchians. Pseudosuchians, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, lots of basically they're like if it's extinct and has and is not a a mammal, then it's all lumped into one. Basically, yeah, that's not how taxonomy should be working, but that's okay. We'll forgive it. Uh, then on the right, you have walruses. You know, you got um, different seals. Ooh, the babarusa. Uh, yeah, pigs. Um, uh, Glyptodon, rhinos. Um, well, not all of those are rhinos. Uh, there's a, a brontothere there. right there in the middle. Yeah, there's a brontothere. There's a uintothere, which isn't even like closely related to rhinos. I don't think there's. I don't actually remember what the taxonomy for uintotheres is because they're weird. Time to find they're out. Weird. Google machine, do your thing. Um, and then elephants down there on the bottom, and then the arsenothere, which is that guy who looks kind of like a rhino. Um, but arsenothere's are actually afrotheres, so they're related to elephants. Um, next slide, please. And then so, the variety. Oh, go uh, ahead, Dapper. A winter winter theories are in Dinosaurata, which is actually um, a sister group to Parasodactyla. So they're not very closely oh. related, but they are. Okay. In they're sort of like stem Parasodactyls, basically. That's kind of cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's very interesting. That's according to Wikipedia, which I just checked. So who knows. I mean, Wikipedia is usually pretty on top of the new developments, so... Okay. Oh, wait, well, I want to know what the anvil on the shark's head is. Oh, uh, that was... Um, what was it? Hybotus? Oh, no, sorry, Stethacanthus. That's what it was. So that was Stethacanthus. So if I remember correctly, I don't think... Uh, and that was directed at Ray Rod. I don't think Stethacanthus is a shark. I'll put it in the... I think it's a... Um, a chimera... If I remember correctly, it's in the Chimera group. Um, I like so that we yeah. have Pecora. Just the whole thing is just Pecora. Yep. Yeah. Lots of, yeah, we got all these different uh, ruminant ungulates. So we have. Um, we got uh, giraffids, crap, antilocaprids, yeah, bovids, I'm, cervids. I'm drawing a blank on uh, like synthetocerids. That's what they're called. Those first guys up there. And those were some, they came with some really weird. Um, horn uh or antler um yeah uh formations and yeah you're right we got giraffids uh yeah antilocaprids um cervids um bovids at the bottom they're cut off but they're there yep yep some bovids okay I mean, uh, bovidae next... is a great family it's lots of cool animals like sheep yes. and, and cows whoa hold on a second are you telling me that people tend to think of goats and sheep and cows as being in the same group and uh, well, gazelles? taxonomists certainly do. Yeah, uh, is that what you're saying? Yes, they are. They are uh, in the same group. And despite the fact that Kurt Wise thinks that it's cowardly to not put Group C in either Group D or, I guess, Group F over with the cervids, uh, no, they're their own thing. <laughs> I, I have a video coming out about Kurt Wise telling me that I'm a coward for recognizing that Adelocapridae is not just either a gazelle or a deer. Yeah. Pick a taxonomic lane, you coward. No. Yeah. Uh, How dare you recognize that they group with giraffes more than they do with deer or antelope? In case okay. anyone's confused, Antilocapridae is the family that is now only represented by the uh, American pronghorn, which are really cool, and you should look into them. And I, I always enjoy cool. seeing them in the wild, which I do, have done from time to time. Yeah. And uh, next slide, please. Okay, now Novel seems like a good time. place to now seems like a good place to call it because it's been two hours. Okay. Um. So. Um. So everybody, uh, this is part one. <laughs> we'll do more of these. Um. Thank you, Dapper. Uh, do you have any comments you want to make before we go off air? Um. I do appreciate the uh, the dinosaur representation. Uh, it's it's nice. 
um, even on this slide. Also, I think this is a, a nice little intro. Um, and hey, who knows, maybe someone who's like studying for their like intro to biology course will find this useful. Or maybe some anti-evolutionists will take a look at this and uh, stop doing so many straw mans because uh, I, it does get tiring when the anti-evolutionists don't have an understanding of evolution that would satisfy anyone in the field that they know what they're talking about in the first place. Yeah, it's really not that hard to just ask mm -hmm. people who accept evolution what they think about evolution. It really isn't hard, and here you have it. Especially the people who are, you know, reasonably well-read on the topic. Don't do yeah. the Ray Comfort where you find some guy off the street who doesn't know <laughs> really anything, and then take that as like, oh, see, these evolutionists are just dumb. Yep, no, that's also dishonest. Although he did mm -hmm. talk to PZ and still, like, tried to represent or misrepresent PZ, which is... Yeah, didn't he just obviously edit him? Yeah, it's kind of insane. Yeah. Like, you don't want to listen to normal people, and you don't want to listen to actual PhD researchers. So, you know, whatever. At any rate. Um, all right, so. Part one down. Uh, and if you guys uh, are a fan of what you've seen from Dapper, go check out his channel. It is linked in the doobity-doo. And he's yes. a really cool guy. Thank you. Uh, he's, he's got some cool videos. Highly recommend. And uh, if, perchance, you're seeing this sometime months after when we streamed it, because that's probably when it will happen, because uh, I, I will eventually mirror this, uh, go subscribe to Jackson's channel, which I'm intending to link. Um, so, Jackson, if at some point you come across this video on my channel as a mirror and it doesn't have a link to your channel, please feel free to yell very loudly at me. We'll just uh, flog you. That's what I'll do. I mean, if you want to come all the way out here, uh, then sure. Well, you said you said you would make me. Um, what was it? Some gruel. <laughs> so, yeah, if you want well, some gruel, Jackson, I'll make you some gruel. You'll make me the gruel, and then I'll flog you after that. Okay. All right. All right. Do you think your gruel savory or sweet? S sweet, I guess. Okay, I'll put some like brown sugar in it or something like that. That sounds good. Okay. Some oh, reasons. That. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, thank you again to Peter for hosting as always. And thank you everyone in, in the audience for being here. So have a wonderful night, everybody. And we'll see you all next time.